So I don't know about you, but I have always fantasized about riding and training in Europe, the glory land of dressage. There are those of us who dream about it, but then there are those riders who actually go and do it. I'm not one of them, but I am one of your hosts, Lindsay Paulson, and in this episode of the Dressage Today podcast, I sat down with young Grand Prix rider Allie Potaski to hear about her experience working, riding, and training abroad. While Allie currently works for Kathy Priest and her Woodspring Farm as assistant trainer, Allie had the opportunity to work for Morton Thompson for almost four years at his home base in central Denmark. Morton, who is known around the world for his ability to bring horses to the height of the international levels, has competed in two Olympic Games and coached riders including Stefan Peters, Catherine Haddad, Sue Blinks, Andreas Helgstrand, Christine Traurig, and more. Allie and I chat about some of her big takeaways during her time working for Morton in terms of training, horse management, and life lessons. You'll hear Allie's reflections on her experience and her advice for up-and-coming riders. We hope you enjoy! Hey there, I'm Jennifer Malachi. And I'm Lindsay Paulson. We're the hosts of the Dressage Today podcast, where you can find us talking about anything and everything dressage related. Our conversations span the world of dressage, from leading riders to local level dressage heroes. We're talking training advice, horse care tips, and stories to inspire your own dressage journey. Tune in, then tack up. So we know that before you left for Denmark, you were training with Pamela Goodrich and you were competing at Grand Prix on a horse named Lamborghini or Zumi. Uh, Tell me a little bit about your riding background as a kid and um, basically your background before you got to that point. How did you grow up riding? Were you taking dressage lessons from day one? Did you event? How did that get started? So I've ridden from an early age. Like my mom took me to lessons every week, um, but nothing too serious. And then... I actually started with Fjord ponies, um, eventing and doing absolutely everything with them, driving, draft work, pulling logs, just having fun. I went to a venting camp and, you know, when I was 13. And then in high school, I started to focus more on dressage, but I did the IEA, the um, hunter. That was that. But I met Chris Hickey. He was in Western Mass where I grew up. So he was one of my first biggest dressage only mentors. So when I graduated from high school, I followed him to Hilltop in Maryland where he relocated. And I worked a year there as a groom. And initially it was supposed to be a gap year and I was gonna go back to college. (laughs) So I got into a couple schools. I deferred from University of Vermont. Said, okay, I'll groom a year and get it out of my system and then go to college and that didn't happen so (laughs) I just really enjoyed it and after Hilltop I got a job with Pam Goodrich as a working student and that's kind of where everything started with the riding more I rode a little bit at Hilltop but it was mostly hacking them and stretching them and warming them up or I was uh, strictly a groom with Pam I was with Pam for four years And she helped me find some horses to compete on because I've never owned a horse of my own. I just couldn't afford it. So she helped me. I free leased a couple horses through her. And I did Young Riders when I was 21 on a horse that she helped me to connect with who taught me a really a lot about riding. He was a handful. Was that Zumi? No, this was Chocomo M. He was big black horse. And then after that, so that was Young Riders. And then after that, Jocelyn owned Zumi and Jocelyn Weiss. And she was going to leave Zumi with Pam and I because Pam's always known Zumi. So she was going to leave him for a couple months while she got settled into law school because she got accepted to law school, and then she pretty much realized that that was going to be a lot for her to be in school full-time and riding full-time. So I got to lease him, and that's how that happened, through Pam as well. And he was, yeah, a big part of start of me showing through the levels and really getting to ride a horse with some resume and some talent. So 
I, I ask about Zumi because I think we we did a story about Zumi for Dressage yeah, Today did, a while yeah. back. Yeah. From that point, the story goes that you rode with Morton in a clinic once. Um, and then he had connected with a few people, Chris Hickey, I think, who had recommended you. Um, so he called you, offered you a position. So then you packed your bags and headed off for Denmark. That's that's kind of the short condensed yeah. version. That's that's a like huge undertaking from a logistic and a financial standpoint. So could you tell me more about how you were able to pull all that off? I wasn't really looking for another job, but at that point I was Pam's barn manager and you know, I was not riding a ton and I was thinking, oh, maybe I could get a riding job somewhere. So that's how Morton and I connected. But for me, I'm, I'm pretty adventurous. So it didn't, it didn't really make me nervous like it probably should have. And I also had a lot of support, like especially through Chris, because he was close with Morton. So it wasn't a blind leap over there. I had a lot of background on Morton and great references to him. And Pam was really supportive of it too. And they kind of encouraged me, I guess. I don't know. For me, it didn't feel like a huge deal. It felt like a really good next step. And in terms of like logistics, financially, it wasn't a big step for me because I wasn't bringing a horse and I knew I had a job over there. They were taking care of me. So all I had to do was pay for my flight. Um, And then I would, you know, have a job. So bringing a horse would have been a totally different situation. But I just was really excited because I was in Germany in, I think, 2010, 2009 visiting and I actually spent three months there so I've I'd already been to Europe so I I knew in a sense a little bit what to expect um and saw the horse scene there so it was really more of an exciting thing for me and a little bit all of my jobs I just have good references on the people that I'm gonna work for same with Kathy now I work for Kathy and I didn't even really have a interview or anything um I just knew her through a lot of other people and she knew me through a lot of other people so it's kind of nice to just have people looking out for you (laughs) just kind of go into a little bit what kind of considerations go into planning to leave to take a professional position overseas I I know it obviously was less complicated because you didn't have a horse to deal with but in terms of like visas and stuff like that not that you have to go into great detail about that but was that a big complicating factor. So it was, but the thing that made it easier was that I already had a job going over there. So it's it's more complicated if if you're going over there and then looking for a job because they can start the process knowing you're coming over and Sarah and Morton, they done it before with um more Canadians, but they knew what they were doing with with the paperwork. So I pretty much trusted them with that. And I actually got a athletic visa. It wasn't a working visa. So it was more of a training. And um, I had to submit scores that I'd gotten and um, that kind of thing. So, And they knew I was getting paid. But it was just not a strict work visa, which made it actually easier. And all we had to do was just renew it every year. Okay. But Morton's wife, Sarah, really led me through all of the logistics, which was absolutely life-saving because I have no clue about that (laughs) um and yeah in terms of the job I think just knowing what I was getting into a little bit a couple in-depth phone conversations but other than that go on an adventure (laughs) you you sound like the kind of person who's who's easygoing and and ready for whatever comes at you let's talk about the the attitude or the mindset that you have going into this as you're like sitting on the plane flying over there, what, what kind of expectations are running through your mind or, or maybe you don't have expectations. What, 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 what's going through your head? Well, I didn't honestly, when Morton called me, I was at, at a gas station and I remember I was in, in West Palm. I was going to pick up my mom at the airport. I was down in Florida with Pam and he called me and there's this weird number and I was like, Oh my gosh, what is this? I answered and, He said, Morton Thompson. I was like, oh, my God. And I actually, I was totally in a kerfuffle. Like, I dropped my keys in the trash. Like, I was just (laughs) totally out of my element. And so when I was on the phone with him, I didn't really want to ask 
specifics because I didn't want to sound like needy or, you know, really concerned and high maintenance. So all I knew going over there was that I was going to be riding. I was hired. Well, no, I was hired like as the rider. I, I knew it wouldn't. Of course, there's always barn duties and everything, but he specifically said he needed someone to keep the horses going when he was away because he's teaching clinics quite a bit of the time. So he needs someone that stays home and, and keeps all of his horses going. So I knew I'd be riding a lot, and it was a riding position. And he'd seen me ride, and so I wasn't super nervous. But And I, I also knew I'd be living at the barn. And, you know, I had a good amount of confidence that it would be a pretty similar to what I was used to in terms of like day to day barn work and you know they're all horses like in Europe or here mm. they all need the same care and that was mostly I was just excited and had to get all my stuff into two suitcases which was kind of <laughs> yeah it was a lot and also being over there for that am amount of time and coming back with two suitcases was almost harder <laughs> you know going over there just really curious more than anything mm -hmm. I'm really easygoing about stuff and everything so I can get it get myself around and taken care of anywhere so <laughs> when you got to Morton's let's talk about your role once you're actually there um what was your daily routine like so he has a big um stable probably around 20 horses and a few younger ones and a few older ones so some client horses and his own personal horses and Sarah's personal horses. So it's a really beautiful barn. Um, I don't know if you've seen pictures, but it's it's amazing. Um, so I got there and pretty much like dove right in the first day. I think I rode six or seven. I just jumped on a bunch of the horses and started. And he's like, okay, well, here we go. And Day to day, we started at 7, and then I did, you know, some feeding and, like, just making sure everything was okay, the horses were good, maybe putting out a few into turnout. And then I really just started riding. I had a groom, <laughs> so that's that was very, very new for me, yeah, and still just kind of blows my mind that I have a groom. So she would get horses ready for me and I'd ride till one. And then we had a little midday break from one to three every day. Oh, we had a, I guess it was a siesta lunch. Um, and that was really nice because it was pretty regular like that. You know, it wasn't every day we did have a break. And then in the afternoon, we would finish up the horses um, and do a lot of cleaning, which was Something that I, in the beginning, I was kind of like, wow, this is this is a lot. But in the end, I really started to appreciate how it made everything stay really neat and really looking good and having a good work environment. Um, but we cleaned a lot. And that's something that I'll, I'll really, I sticks with me because it's kind of, it is important. Like we would vacuum and we'd clean the windows and we would cobweb and do the dusting every day and we we did it together so it wasn't a lot of work but it was just um a small thing you do every day to just keep things really in order you know any kind of odd job in the afternoon I really did a bit of everything like I drive the tractor drag the arena take care of the field horses you know do do anything that our riding horses needed like you know medicines or bandaging all the all the normal stuff we do here um, and then feed and finish up around like 5.30 or 6. Can you tell me a little bit about Morton's philosophies in terms of horse management and training? So for me also that wasn't a huge jump. I was kind of warned that going to Europe I would have a lot of things that were different than what I had learned here in terms of you know care and management. But honestly it's it wasn't so different than than what we're used to. The horses were all turned out, you know, they had good paddocks and gotten out of their stalls a few times a day, you know, good grain, good hay, everything was quite similar in terms of the management, um, and he used really good, like, body work people, chiropractic, everything that I was a bit warned about that they didn't do in Europe, you know, you always kind of hear, oh, they just, you know, just ride and that's the end of it, but 
Morton does, you know, he has the top care, that really nice farrier. Um, everything is taken care of really well. And he's, you know, that's in line with his training philosophy that, like, the horses have to be happy and healthy. And then, you know, you go from there. But I think he taught me a lot that there should be a system to educating a horse, which is something that I really took away from him because with Pam, I'd always ridden a horse that had already been trained to that level. Um, yeah, school horse. Zumi was, I was the third person that did Grand Prix on him. I mean, you know, it was totally different. It was about my riding and about me asking, right, the aids, r test riding, that kind of thing. And I'd never been, you know, required to kind of help bring a horse up the levels. So Morton really has a system for everything, um, for starting horses. I actually told him on the phone, like, while scrounging for my keys. <laughs> and the, you know, I was like, well, I don't break in horses. I don't ride three-year-olds. I'm not brave, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, okay, no problem. And I think the first winter, him and I together, we started two or three horses because he he said to me look like I know you think you're nervous but watch how I do it like I'll teach you and it doesn't have to be something that's a big deal you know you just train the horse and give them the tools they need to you know be quiet and be calm and be confident and then that's that you have fun it's not like a rodeo like I kind of <laughs> had in my head or something so yeah that's a huge part of what he does he just really emphasizes educating it's not a logical you know riding it's one thing leads to another and the horse understands and is confident and you know he always joked with me he'd he'd bring out the horse from him working it and he'd be like oh well he doesn't have to sweat to learn, you know, so it's it was quite, quite good. I learned a lot. And so you kind of just touched on this a little bit, in, in, you know, in terms of saying the horses don't have to sweat to learn and stuff like that. Um, and, and you've talked about what you took away from the value of keeping things clean in terms of barn management. Can you tell me a little bit more about the most valuable pieces of uh, pieces of advice that you took away? Um, from your time with Morton? Um, I think, like I said, the, the thing that was the newest and the most, made the mo biggest impression on me was the system that he emphasized and and really having something that makes sense to the horse, that you're not just riding every day aimlessly, um, trying to accomplish something that makes sense in your head, but the horse is confused and therefore, you know, might stop trying or might get nervous. And I remember I was, we had a horse in for training and it, it had trouble with the changes and Morton could, could do them. And he said, okay, you, you try it. And I'm like, uh, well, you can barely do it. I don't think I should be trying. And he said, you know, Allie, he said, you're not going to do any harm if the horse isn't upset. And that's something I remember a lot because I have kind of a, <laughs> I don't know what, what the word is, paranoia <laughs> that I'm going to mess something up or that I'm, you know, going to make a problem for whoever gets on the horse next. And he always told me, look, if the horse doesn't know that it's not right or that, that you're, you know, you're messing up, he said, I can get on behind you and do it how I did it. He said, it's only when you start to really stress the horse about it, that it has baggage. So with that advice, I kind of started doing things with the horses that he had done, or I actually started to do them by myself and new things, new movements or things that the horse had trouble with, with that mindset that maybe I wasn't asking a thousand percent right, but I was giving the horse confidence and it was more of an evolution. So that was really something that he, same with starting the young horses. I learned a lot, a lot about that and the groundwork and teaching them just to have a good reaction to pressure and a good, a good foundation from the ground that once you got on them, they were really, they knew how to respond and 
were really quiet about it. I think the, the paranoia that you mentioned of like messing horses up, I think that's something that so many of us struggle with, you know, whether you're professional or adult amateur or whatever. I know even with, with my own, you know, 18 year old horse, it's pretty set in her ways. I get on her and I'm like, I don't want to screw her up. And, uh, <laughs> he, he would always, you know, tell me cause he would be away and I'd be riding the horses and keeping them in work for him. And he, he had some, you know, trained horses that he was riding and I had to ride. And he, he always told me kind of jokingly, like, it doesn't really matter what I can personally do on the horse. Like if no one's looking and I go in the arena and I do two tempes and then Morton comes back the next day and wants to do two tempes and then they're gone. You know, he said that is less important to him. He doesn't want me to, to just ride movements to do them. And so that was kind of cool too, because I learned how to in a way, like set the horse up for him. Like I do single changes that were really easy enough, a really correct aid. And then what do you know, Morton rides the horse and he has a really good feeling because I did more basics. Um, so that's interesting too, because you think you're riding trained horses, like oh, I should be able to do all the, the high level stuff. But sometimes my job was just to keep them feeling really soft and feeling really good. And that way when he got back, he could just go at it like he didn't miss a beat. So I think for, uh, you know, a lot of younger riders over here in, in the United States, we have this fantasy of one day going over to Europe and, you know, to the glory land of dressage. Um, and for some of us, that time has has passed, <laughs> but it's still nice to think about. But um, what kind of advice do you have for um, young riders or young professionals who are eventually hoping to train overseas one day? I would say that it's it's something that it's not for everyone, but it's really a good, for me, totally amazing experience. But the only thing that I think is different is it's not as emotional. You know, the, they're, they're a little bit more – it's a business for a lot of – and not I'm not speaking about Morton necessarily, but a lot of the big – farms over there like you have to be useful and you have to do you know be able to get done what they want you to get done and so me having Pam teach me every day for four years was a, a really good foundation for that because I had a lot of help with Pam and when I went to Morton's like of course he will help he will teach me on some of the horses but at the end of the day, you have to be able to do it alone a lot of the time and be on your own and kind of understand and think through things. And, you know, of course, I got a lot of training when I was over there, which is really lucky, but it's not, you know, it's not so like fuzzy and warm. You really have to work and do what you, you know, are meant to do and not, not be emotional about it, you know, not be hurt if someone else gets to ride the horse because they ride it better or you know anything like that I think it's it's definitely really something that a lot of people should do if they can and I'd also say to do your research of who you want to work for because I had an amazing time working for Morton but I've we've all heard stories about you know it being really really tough and really a lot of work and a lot of hours which didn't happen to me I was it was totally fair and what I signed up for and all of it's hard work we work hard over here too but really know what you're getting into and have don't go blind into it have some sort of references on who you want to get a job with or really know what you're getting into I would say so right now you know we've just come off of um that the world equestrian games in September the U.S. having a super super strong finish and we're seeing the U.S. develop these horses that are very competitive with what's being produced in Europe. So as we see dressage going, growing stronger and stronger in the U.S., do you think it's still advantageous to go train overseas? Do you think there's still an edge to be gained from from working over in Europe and seeing the way things are done there? I definitely do because it's on a bigger scale, I would say, over in Europe. And what I really admire about a lot of the best riders, uh, regardless of nationality is what I think I aspire to do one day is just 
have the ability to have one horse after the other coming out at the top. And if you look at, you know, the best, if they're, you know, scheduled to go to a CDI and their horse is lame, they have three ready to go behind them. And that's, to me, that's really something that you have to learn from and comes from having a system and comes from having good management and good quality horses and just really good riding. And there's a lot of that in Europe. You know, people have horses coming up behind their top horses a lot. And um, look at Isabel and Charlotte. Like, they're, they're not done when their top horse retires. They have a lot more coming up. And that's just something that really inspires me because I think the training is the fun part of it. And, you know, I could live without showing per se but riding day in and day out and teaching the horses things and yeah I just think that also the the breeding and the generally like the quantity of everything is much bigger over there so it's just a different culture too and I think it's still really a good a good thing to go over but coming back here now you see the differences but you also see the similarities and where we're all riding horses, we're all training horses. It doesn't matter what country you're in. So it's really fun to have that connection too and and have contacts over there and maybe buy horses over there or go back someday. That's one thing that, that I've thought was really interesting with, with dressage is and, and equestrian sports in general, but you know, I mean I obviously have not traveled as extensively as you have in, in Europe, but even just the short periods of time that I've spent over there, um, you know, for, for the magazine or for personal reasons or whatever, I've, I've always appreciated how you can walk into a dressage barn anywhere in pretty much in the world and you can feel like you're at home. And I think that's a pretty neat feeling. So you sound like the the kind of person that's sort of hard to surprise, um, with, with the way it sounds like you're easygoing about stuff. Um, but were there any big surprises that, that kind of crept up on you during your time there? Honestly, not really. Like, I didn't know much at all about Denmark, which is yeah. also well, the next question, but not a lot of surprises. And, and I am really self-sufficient, too, so it didn't bother me to be so far away. You know, it's, it is hard to think you can't go home for a weekend or your airline ticket is, you know, more of your salary than you want to admit. But as far as horse surprises, not too many. Just good surprises, you know, opportunities. I got to show in some young horse classes, which I wasn't really counting on showing too much. I got to do a little bit of showing and, yeah, just making a lot of connections. I think that was important for me, too, going to those big barns and seeing seeing that and just doing a little bit of traveling. So just small good surprises, but nothing that was totally blew me out of the water. So switching gears from talking about horses, um, let's talk about just how you found Denmark in general. Um, how how did you find the culture, the food, the language? Um, was there any kind of culture shock in that way? Well, everyone always asked me if I speak Danish when I came back, and I, oh, uh, no, I don't. And I kind of regret that a little bit, but at the same time, I have to say the Danes are really amazing they anyone under the age of I don't know 60 70 speaks really really great English and then in the barn we actually didn't employ any Danes so we always spoke English because that was the common language Um, I worked with quite a lot of people from different places like Canada and um, Estonia Croatia Germany so English was really widely spoken, so I didn't, I pick, of course, I picked up Danish, but nothing, I'm far from (laughs) fluent or even wanting to have a conversation in Danish, but I really like traveling in general, not, not even to do with horses, I've traveled before going to Denmark, I find it really interesting, so I loved it, I got to travel My mom came and visited, and we went to Norway and Sweden, um, and I've been to Germany, so just a lot of culture, but, you know, in terms of the food and, like, the going downtown and just eating, it's, it's pretty similar to the U.S. I could get all the 
stuff I needed quite easily and you know they always sell pasta and <laughs> hamburgers and <laughs> they have McDonald's I was I was in a taxi one time coming back from the um airport or some train station and uh, the man asked me, they, they can't really tell between a British accent and an American accent sometimes, so he asked me if I was American or British, and I said, oh, I'm American, and he said, he got all excited, and he was like, "Do you did you know there's a new Burger King coming in? And I was like, um, okay, thank you for stereotyping, but, but uh, you know, just because I'm American, like, I don't need to get excited about our chain, you know, fast foods coming into town. So it's, a, you know, it's funny. And I was also over there during the election. So it was it was very eye-opening just how people view America in terms both in riding and in just general and culture. Um, but I loved it and I made a lot of friends, uh, especially people that I worked with that I still keep in contact with. You know, other other friends too. I ran a half marathon. I just, I don't know just enjoyed it. Your story about the Burger King just briefly like reminded me <laughs> of, um, <laughs> of a time when I was in England and I was walking down the street with some college kids that we had found that were kind of our age too. And, and in their like very charming British accent, they were like, have you heard of Kentucky Fried Chicken? And we're like, yes, we, we are familiar with Kentucky Fried Chicken. And we were like, do you know what Kentucky is? And they go, it's that gold crispy stuff on the outside of the chicken, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's one of my favorite stories about American fast food. You had mentioned it's interesting learning about the way that Europeans perceive American riding. Can you tell, talk more about that? Yeah, they, well, especially being over there and having Americans come in to buy horses, especially because I wasn't really at competition, big competitions. I was never, you know, at um, any sort of big events where the American team was over competing. But... <laughs> Well, first of all, they kind of joke about our vettings because we like a lot of x-rays and we have um, a very, you know, intense vetting. They think that's a little bit funny. But yeah, it's it's interesting too, also to go a little off topic, is how they, everyone kind of took almost a little bit to warm up to me in a way. Mm -hmm. Nothing impersonal, but like, I think it was a big change for me to be there over a year that that people started seeing me a bit more as like not a Dane but but as someone that was just over there working and not an American coming over to you know just ride or show or whatever um, and I really felt a, a shift of how I became a little bit more like an honorary European um, which was which was kind of cool because we had another client and she actually didn't know I was American and then after a while, she found out, and she was like, oh, man. And that was a little bit shocking to me in a way because I was like, oh, um, okay. <laughs> uh, and she's like, oh, don't worry, don't worry. And I said, you know, it's it's fine. I just, it's just interesting that I wouldn't say that they, they definitely don't look down on us, but I think, you know, they, like, thought I had a BMW at first. I mean, I don't know. It was a bunch of just funny how the cultures are different and and how yeah just how you kind of evolve from being a guest to being more I don't know accepted as one um because I actually got really really close with Morin and his family um and his kids and I was over there you know babysitting and doing doing dinners and doing stuff with them but it it took a little while it's kind of a typical like Scandinavian you know in the beginning they're a little bit closed off and it takes earning your not not the respect but it takes earning you know earning their trust in you and whereas an American to me more is very open um, very friendly very accepting you know the first day that I worked for Kathy it was like oh welcome to the family you know that kind of hospitality whereas in Europe, I definitely felt I had to to earn that, and not just in my job, but you know, in in making friends and in really getting getting immersed in the culture. One of my uh, really close friends who is is German. She she and I always kind of joke about um, how we she and I 
spent a lot of time in Savannah, Georgia together. And we were joking about how, you know, you walk down the street and there's 50 people who want to wave and say hi to you. And she's like, why does everyone want to say hi to me? It's so strange. Or, or she and I also joke about how um, Americans seem to be very into small talk about, you know, the weather or, or whatever it is. And, and she was like, we, we, we don't do that. And, and I know that's, that's a big generalization, of course, but it, it is interesting, those, those small cultural differences. Tell me more about what you're doing now and what's on the horizon, what's coming up. So I left Morton's about two years ago, and I actually took a little bit of time off. My family like had recently moved from Massachusetts to Utah, and it was, you know, a little bit taking its toll to not be so close to them. So I actually spent the winter in Utah teaching skiing, um, and I had, you know, I told Morton, Morton that, and we agreed that, you know, he'd help me find another job if I wanted that, and which he did. So... I got in touch with Kathy Priest, and I started working for her in April in Kentucky. April of of two years ago, so 2017. Because I only took a few months in Utah. Um, Just recharge the batteries, have some fun. I love the mountains and skiing, so it was really really nice to be with the family. Um, And then... It was a bit the same with coming to Kathy's. I didn't have too much notice that I was going to move out to Kentucky. So, yeah, just get my stuff together and (laughs) go go on another adventure. But I had, again, the same thing. Morton really recommended her, and Kathy and I connected and talked, and, you know, everything seemed to be good to go. So I moved to Kentucky, and then... I do pretty much the same thing for Kathy as I did for Mort, and I, I ride a lot. Um, I do definitely do more competing, which is something that is really exciting for me to have the chance to compete, and it's something that I really feel like I need to work on with myself. I feel com- competition riding is something that I, I've always a little bit struggled with, and not even the nerves of it, but just getting in there and making it happen and um I just love training so that was a good thing that Kathy really offered me is the opportunity to compete all her young horses and sales horses so I've been here for two years and now we're down in what we come down for the winters in Wellington and yeah I got really lucky I I did well with two of her young horses last year and took them to Lamplight so she's just been really supportive of me and getting me out there more, um, doing clinics and, you know, some of the programs with like the developing athletes and all that. So that's been a new thing for me through Kathy. She's really enabled that, which is awesome. I hope that, yeah, we have some good horses and just keep kind of bringing them a- along and she always jokes that she's too old to compete, so I have to do it, but come on. <laughs> she still has to show us how it's done, so. <laughs> but, yeah, I've been I've been riding a lot here, and, you know, same thing, helping around the barn and making sure everything's taken care of. Do you have hopes to maybe be on a podium one day or, or you know, o- open your own business or anything along those lines? Something that's kind of interesting about me is that I really like working for someone. Um, I, do- I also don't think I have great business skills and um, I-, I really enjoy being under someone and getting the opportunity to, to have a mentor like that and to have um, lessons and that's so I just feel like there's so much more learning to do that yeah of course I want to compete at the top like we all do but at the end of the day y'all have to train and um being being well working for you know Pam and Morton and Kathy has given me a lot of opportunity to ride much nicer horses than I ever would on my own um I can't, I still can't afford a a horse that, you know, would take me anywhere. I I can, I've actually 
bought a sales horse last year and sold her, which was kind of fun. Yeah. Um, but in terms of like the opportunities, I just feel like it's stupid for me to to want to go out on my own and you know be riding first level when I can have this opportunity that someone is behind me giving me the horses and training me. So for now, I'm just quite happy with that. I would love to go back to Europe um, eventually, and I don't know if it would be with a horse or without a horse. I, I'm pretty open. I mean, obviously I have goals, but I'm also a person that really just is very content following what's happening, and things change so much. So just enjoying the opportunity that as it comes along and then having faith in someone like now Kathy's been really wonderful and pushing me so she she's she's helping with that I think there's a lot to be said for people who like you who have you know ambition to go go and do big things but also have the ability to to be present in where they are at the current time and appreciate what's going on so um no I think that's that's a really valuable perspective to have so thanks a lot for taking the time to chat with me today and and I I think you know a lot of people will find what you've had to say relatable even though they haven't had the chance to maybe go train overseas as well but um we've enjoyed hearing your story so thank you so much if you liked hearing about Allie's experience with Morton Thompson and you're curious to know more about his dressage training techniques and philosophies, head over to dressagetoday.com to read Beth Baumert's training article, Easy Canter Pirouettes with Morton Thompson. In this how-to article, Morton explains how to teach your horse this complex movement from the walk with steps demonstrated by Chris Hickey. Thanks for listening to the Dressage Today podcast. You can learn more from Dressage Today and read in-depth training articles at dressagetoday.com or you can visit our new on-demand video site, dressagetodayonline.com. And for daily dressage training tips and advice, give us a follow on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest. Happy riding! The Dressage Today podcast is a production of the Equine Podcast Network an entity of Active Interest Media and the Equine Network.